Slendy, hey bro, Slendy, hey. You already know what's up. What's that? Another home run. But you know the job ain't done. Till we hold that trophy up. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to episode 524 of the Talking Friars podcast and YouTube show. Ben Fenn with you here November 27th, 2023. Special guest, Greg Garcia, his second time on the show. Former Padre, former St. Louis Cardinal, and that's relevant because he used to play under the current manager now of the San Diego Padres, Mike Schilt. First off, Greg, thanks so much for the time. Really appreciate it. How's it going? A life being in the I'm good, man. I'm good. Thanks for having me back on. Yeah, I feel like I'm doing uh, the Mike Schilt media tour here. Yeah. Uh, uh -huh. It's good, though. I enjoy it. It's somebody who I enjoy talking about. And, uh, but yeah, everything else for me personally is going well. I had a great Thanksgiving and uh, looking forward to the Christmas season. And, uh, yeah, everything else is great, man. I got uh, everything's going well. Awesome. So I'll try to ask you some questions. Ben and Woods and Darn A Trip uh, didn't ask you. But just there first you off, First off, with Mike Schilt, you know, your reaction, your first reaction when you saw the news, Mike Schilt named Padres manager, were you surprised by it or it was like, no, this is this is definitely who I thought was going to become the manager? Yeah, when I saw that he was one of the candidates to take over the job, I was like, okay, that's kind of a no-brainer. I feel like he's, he's really super qualified, obviously. Not that the other candidates weren't, but um, I think he brings uh, – a winning culture to us, you know, coming from St. Louis. And like I said, in, in previous kind of interviews, all the winning he did in the minor leagues, this guy just knows how to win and he knows how to get the most out of his players. So I think uh, I wasn't shocked when he ended up getting the job. I think everyone was kind of, uh, they were pretty sure that was going to be it. And when he got it at that, um, I was like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Do you, what was your first uh, impression of Mike Schilt when you met him first in the minor leagues? Because you came, yeah. he was, was he your first minor league coach? Yeah, he was my first first professional manager. It was uh, Johnson City, Tennessee. And my first impression of him was like very much old school, uh, grew up around the game. You know, I, he'll tell, tell stories where I think he was in the same clubhouse as like Cal Ripken as a kid. Uh, he was kind of like the bat boy clubhouse guy and just kind of hang around those guys. And so – he had such an appreciation and love for baseball that, you know, I, I had not seen, you know, for a while. And uh, you could tell this is what he wanted to do in his life. And he was so he was so happy being the Johnson City manager. Uh -huh. and, but he was just so good at what he did that he kept progressing through the minor leagues, uh, almost like a player. And then finally had, had an opportunity to, to manage the St. Louis Cardinals at the major league level. And I know for him, spending all those years in that organization, was an absolute treat and he cherished every every second of that so um yeah my first impression was this guy's old school baseball uh loves the game and and loves his players how different is that like you talk about the progression kind of like a player i don't i don't see that very often yeah especially within the organization i i think nowadays it's probably even more rare for somebody to kind of like you know, start in rookie ball at a, at a baseball organization and make their way up to the major leagues from a coaching or a managerial standpoint. You see so many players now getting back into the game, uh, whether it be a bench coach role or first base or something like that, that they kind of leapfrog all these other minor league coaches um, just because maybe relationships in place or things like that. And then you see those guys, uh, you know, like a Skip Schumacher or David Ross, kind of our Craig Council kind of jump into that managerial role after being a bench coach or a first base coach for two or three seasons. So, yeah, I think Mike Schilt's journey is is absolutely rare, especially in today's game, for sure. What do you think makes Mike different from some of your past managers, someone like Andy Green with the Padres? Now, obviously, some would say, well, the players. I mean, there were good players on the Cardinals. Not saying there weren't good players on the Padres, but it was clear that those are two different. They were two different times when Schilt was managing the Cardinals and he was managing the Padres. But what do you think makes Mike stand out? Yeah, I think, you know, and I enjoyed playing for Andy as well, Andy Green as well. So they both had their strengths for sure. And I think there's a lot of similarities between the two as well. But going back to Mike and kind of what I think makes him the way he is, it's just going back to how he treats his players. And I, I think I said this in a previous interview was, 
he, he has the rare ability to read other people and kind of get on other people's level. And by doing so, he can kind of connect the clubhouse when you have players from all over the world coming from different backgrounds. And I think in a recent interview he just had, he was just kind of like, I'm going to let everybody be who they are. And that's, mm-hmm. he, he, he is really good at it. He never, he's not trying to kind of micromanage you. You got to be a certain player, look a certain way, act a certain way. But when it comes to baseball, that's when he's going to be a stickler about playing the game the right way, playing the game hard. He even said in the quote, like, but enjoying the game, enjoy the game. It's, it's a definitely a new era in baseball, and he's embracing that era. I talked about him being old school. Mm-hmm. You see guys bat flipping and, you know, taking, doing all selfies around the bases where, you know, 15 years ago, that, that doesn't happen, right? So uh, he's embracing the new, the new aspects of the game, but um, – yeah, I think his, his just kind of his love for the players and his ability to kind of connect with people uh, really wants you makes you want to play hard for that guy and kind of basically do whatever you can to to help that team win when you're playing underneath Mike Schilt. How is it you mentioned him getting on that same level as the players? How does he do that? Like, do you have an example that he that he's been able to do that? Yeah, I think he he genuinely tries to get to know you, gets to know your family. Uh, your wife, your kids. He wants to know you more on a personal level than just a professional level. And I think that goes a long ways, you know, and I think that just comes from kind of his humble background where he's just, he just wants to get to know everybody. And by doing so, you can, you can kind of understand what makes guys tick and why they might be the way they are, whether it be a past experience or just kind of how they were brought up. So he does a really good job of doing that. Um, and just kind of getting to know you more on a personal level than just who's Greg Garcia, the baseball player. Like what is, who's Greg Garcia, the human being? Cause I think when you can, you can figure that out, you can figure out, all right, I know how to push this guy or I know what, what can get this guy going. So I think he does that really well. Yeah. How is it? Do you think that he treats the young player that's just coming up versus the Manny Machado of the world or the star player, the Yachty, the Wayno with no. Cardinals? Like, does he, do you think that he gains respect from those veterans quick because he does treat, I don't know if he does, but if he treats the vets kind of the same as the young players in terms of, you know, when they're on the field, treating them the same way, not letting older players do whatever they want. It's, you know, really bringing it back to the team. Yeah. So I think, I think, and you know, this has been a few years since I played for him, but I would say I'd be shocked if from when you know coming up in St. Louis, uh, veteran players were always um, treated really well, and rightfully so, because uh, they've been there longer, they've done it uh, year after year. A person like a Yachty Molina or Adam Wainwright, who've been there forever, they deserve that respect. And Mike's really good about giving that, because that's that's respect that's been earned over time. So I would say he's probably going to continue to do that, whereas the younger player he's not going to make them scared or, or anything or feel uneasy, but yeah, there's definitely going to be perks that a veteran like a Manny Machado is going to get over a, I don't even know the next rookie that could potentially make the team next year. Uh, there's just certain ways. And I think that's important because you want to make sure that's how you kind of control a clubhouse. I feel like as well, it's kind of policing itself, right? So you want the veteran guys to kind of control the clubhouse and you do that by giving the veterans a certain responsibility and the young guys kind of taking some of those uh, things that they can do and just say, no, hey, you're going to do it this way until you reach a different level. And then you can, if you're Manny Machado, you can kind of do whatever you want. You know, as you produce year after year uh, and you know you're going to set a good example for the team. But I would say he definitely puts an emphasis on the veterans uh, and, and ask them to kind of control and police the clubhouse for sure. How is it you talk about the respect with some of those veteran players, those that have been there for a long time? What is that? Is it just giving them the responsibility and trusting them to control the clubhouse or is it other things that fans might not know about? For me, uh, it goes back to the St. Louis Cardinal days. And we, we kind of brought this over in 2019 to the Padres when I first came over here Uh, on a very small scale, what they would do in St. Louis was for spring training. This, there's no way this is a rule anymore. I don't know if it's a rule, but you, if you didn't have three years of service time, major league service time, you had to wear your spring training jersey for practice, uh, you know, those pregame workouts before you go to the game. You know, and you know, you've seen guys in pictures where they're wearing the cutoff hoodies or whatever they want, basically. And 
in St. Louis that was only allowed for the veteran guys. And I actually appreciated that because once I got my three years of service, I was able to do that uh-huh. and it felt good, but it also kept me in check. Uh, even, let's say I had a really good year or something like that, but I only did it for one year. It's a way St. Louis kind of policed it themselves like, Hey, okay. Yeah. Nice year. Uh, way to go rookie. But you know, you're still, you're still very, very fresh to this game. So don't kind of act like you, you got it all figured out. Um, and that's something we did in, in San Diego in 2019 um, when we had the spring training, 2020 got cut. We, we established it in 2020 as well, but then that obviously got cut short because of COVID. But I think something like that really does help. Um, I don't know if that's going to be the case, but I did, I did appreciate that uh, when we were doing that in St. Louis. Yeah, that's a good example. Uh, with you, you hit on 2020, and that made me want to ask this question about Ryan Flaherty. Was he on that coaching staff? Yes, Flash was. Yes, yeah, he okay. was. Yep. What are your experiences with him? Because some Padres fans with this manager search, they were like, oh, that's just Manny's guy. We don't need that. Mm-hmm. Where I'm hesitant to say that because I don't know what Ryan Flaherty does as the offensive coordinator. I know he was in a different role, but like, what were your experiences with Flash? And then the, the thing about Flash is that he will be a manager at some point. There's no question. He has so much knowledge for the game and um, put so much effort into that. I think about 2020, I think he retired in 2019 or maybe 2018. I, I don't, I can't, I can't be certain of that, but I know from going from a player to a coach was very short for him. And he did such a great job in that transition because if you look at Flash's career, he had a really, really nice major league career. He's a really good player for a lot of, a, a long time uh, and carved out a really nice career for himself. And what, by doing that, he ultimately, we all had respect for him when he came over, but then how he went about his business as a coach and getting you information and really transitioning into that role with like zero ego showed a lot about his character, you know? Um, yeah. And I, I have so much respect for that guy. And again, I'm fully confident in saying this guy will manage at some point in the major leagues. So that's what I was saying, going back to the other candidates, Flash is a great candidate uh, and he will get his opportunity you know, it just wasn't wasn't right now, and it wasn't with the San Diego Padres. So, but at some point, he will be a manager in the major leagues. He's that good, and he's that committed to wanting to do it. So it's just a matter of time for him. So you see, like his commitment to learning, like what makes players tick as a coach, like on that different side mm-hmm. of things compared to being a player. Like you talk about his his big league playing career. Yeah, I mean, eight years, twenty nineteen with Cleveland, I think is was his last big league season. Right. Just his. So his communication, um, what are what are some of those other positive aspects you see from him? He was always the first guy there uh, at the at the complex, you know. And as a player, you didn't have to do that. You didn't have to be the first person there. So that's why I'm saying with the transition, he made it so quickly. He was using da- data and like analytics, but not fully like this is end all be all. Um, and he was getting you information. Talk about. Uh, like hitters meetings and things like that. He was really good about going over scouting reports and he was really good about tailoring that to you. Whereas maybe he, w- it wouldn't be like a broad, Hey, this guy throws 95 and is, he's got a sinker and a cutter. And it would be like, he would do that, but then he would break off and go, Hey Greg. So I think this is how this guy's going to attack you tonight. If you get this pinch hit appearance in the seventh against this guy, I would look for something like this. What's your thoughts? And then you kind of like, Oh yeah, I, I like that. Or I, I faced him in the past and, yeah, I think something like that would happen. So his work ethic obviously got him that eight-year career in the big leagues. I think he was a first-rounder out of Vandy. So, um, you know, he was a high-profile guy and then kind of towards the end of his career was like a utility guy. So he's kind of been all facets of the game as well. He was a you know top prospect, and then he was the utility player, like basically my whole career, you know, like just being that utility guy. So he, he kind of has a, a really good grasp of everybody as well. Um, so yeah, he's, he's, he's awesome. He's a great guy. Yeah. When you talk about kind of relating it to the player, the information that he gives to a certain player, being able to dumb it down for lack of better words, Mm -hmm. I feel like that's super important to, to players. I'm obviously not in there, but can you speak to that? And you can relate that to, uh, to Mike Schill, if you want to, if you have experience with that, like getting a message across where players can understand that relate to it, because there's obviously a lot of work to be done, you know, before games and you don't want to be sitting there for, you know, 15 more minutes than you need to be. 
Yeah, the biggest thing that I think Flash does a great job, Mike does a great job. In the past, Damian Easley was really good for me. Uh, John Mabry was really good. Bill Miller were all really good hitting coaches. And just talking about the hitting side of things is it's one thing to make sure your mechanics are ready and you're loose before the game, but it's a whole nother deal to make sure you have an approach for that day and actually having a plan and then going and executing your plan and to your strengths. You know, I don't care if the pitcher has his strengths are, he can command the you know, fastball inside, but that's not a strength of mine. I'm not going to try to change my strength for his, but mm-hmm. I guess going back to your question is, yeah, absolutely having that approach going forward and, and simplifying that approach, but sticking to a plan. And if the plans, you know, baseball as a hitter, you're going to fail more times than not a lot of times actually. But if you, if you have a plan and going up to the plate, that's, that's all you can really do. Because if you don't have a plan, Damien easily would always say, if you don't have an approach or if you don't have a plan, you're already beat. So don't even show up. So make sure you have a plan for that specific at bat because it changes, right? So I could come up with a runner on second and nobody out. My plan is different than first inning of the game, nobody on, nobody out. You know, I'm, I'm leaving off the game. In the first scenario, I want to try to get that runner over to third. It's yep. any way I can, whether it's a bunt, ground ball to second, whatever. If I'm leading off a game, it might be say, hey, can I, how many pitches can I see and get on base? Can I, you know, see it? Can I get this? Can I work this into a deep count, see all of his pitches, you know, be a good steward for my teammates behind me to go relay some information. So like your approach is constantly changing. Um, And Flash and Mike and all those guys I mentioned do a really good job putting the players in the best situation to create that approach and then go execute that plan in the game. Gosh, I love when you're talking about those certain situations. That leads me into Mike Schilt. Obviously, we know about the the yellow pad. Yeah. Um, and just, I, I wonder, I question, is that going to be able to work with the superstars day in, day out, work with this team day in, day out? And I think that it should. Like, if I yeah. was a player, especially coming off of 2023, like, it's right. not working. We need to tur- turn things around somehow. I think yeah. that those players should respect Mike Schilt. They're familiar with him. But do you think that that will work if that does indeed transition over uh, with Mike Schilt as the manager of this team? For those that don't know what I'm talking about there, uh, that's been, I think, chronicled pretty well from Greg um, with yeah. RNA trip and all that. But you can explain it again. But just going over little details, not long meetings, but little details, small things about the game that maybe the players weren't thinking about, but it brings it back into their head fundamental baseball and that I think can be a a difference in winning and losing some games here no question I think uh, you hit it on the head what yellow padding is that's exactly what it is and it's a way for you to learn from the previous game because you're always like oh play for the next game got the next game flush it flush it flush it and that's all well and good but you also want to take time to understand uh, situationally or uh, you know it's not like I said in those meetings you're not watching Manny hit a grand slam in the ninth inning to win the game yeah, you, you, you can read the box score and understand what he did there. And those meetings are, are for something that doesn't show up in the box score that impacted the game, whether it's, you know, stretching a single into a double with two outs, and then the next guy gets a base hit and we score a run because that guy gave effort to stretch that single into that double, gave that next guy an opportunity to drive him in. Now we win by one, you know, something like that. Um, or an unselfish play, you know, maybe for the example, I was talking about the runner on second, nobody out making a, a conscious effort to hit a ground ball to the right side to get that runner over so the next guy can hit a sacrifice fly and score that run. Uh, it's those things that are being talked about. And I do think I, – I don't know if Mike's going to implement. I have no idea. I've not talked to him about it, and that's that's his decision. And ultimately, like you said, it's up to the veteran guys to either buy in or not. My my, my quote was in St. Louis, we had, we had the veterans to buy into that, mm-hmm. uh, the Yachty Molina's the Adam Wainwrights, they controlled our clubhouse. So if they say, Hey, we're doing this, everyone's on board. There's no question. Nobody, nobody's like, I'm not doing it. You're doing it. And it is beneficial if you buy into it because at first glance, like I said, in a previous interview, it could be, it could be looked at as eyewash, right? Like, what are we doing? We're major leaguers. I don't, we don't need to talk about this, but that's all well and good. But if you're not winning games, something needs to change. And you can't always rely on talent. And I think 2023 is a perfect example of that because the San Diego Padres on paper were the most talented team in baseball. But there was something missing there. Is it is it yellow pad meetings? I don't know. It's not all yellow pad meetings, but there's a percentage of that 
that could translate into maybe three or four wins. And guess what? Three or four more wins gets us into the postseason last year. And then it's it's anybody's race. Anybody can go. Look what the Diamondbacks did. They got in and then they got to the World Series. So it's about getting into the October dance. And I think doing the little things can really, really benefit you in a long season. So I don't really know what the question was. I kind of forgot. I went on a little tangent in there. No, but, just uh, if they're going to, yeah, if they're going to buy in and, and just asking you about the fundamentals of the game and the yellow padding the, and the importance. Yeah the, yeah, the veterans I know in the clubhouse personally would be like uh, Manny Machado, um, you know, Joe Musgrove, like those two guys. I'm trying to think, you know, Jake Cronenworth, I guess he's, he's getting up to be the veteran. Todd Tease is getting, you know, three or four years in now, so veteran status. Uh, I'm probably missing a few guys. Xander. Uh, yeah, Xander, but I don't know him personally. But I know yeah, the guys yeah. I just spoke for would be all in on Mike doing this and, and seeing the benefits of it. So yeah. is Mike going to implement it? I have no idea. That's up to him and his staff and kind of his vision. And then, uh, But I think, it, I think it can be very beneficial. Because in St. Louis, when we did it, we're, we were never uh, – in St. Louis, we always had good teams, but it's not like we were the most talented team always. You know, we didn't have – Yeah, 2019, I didn't see – yeah. Right, exactly. So, But it's just you, you had a bunch of guys learning the game. And then that's, I said that in another interview as well. It's, it's, an, it's a way for young players – maybe Manny doesn't need to hear this every day because he's, he, he's been there and he's done that. And he's the, one of the best baseball players in the world. But that rookie, that Greg Garcia, who just broke into the big leagues, it's very beneficial for that guy because he's getting taught the game. Whereas, and especially with guys getting promoted to the big leagues so young now and so early with not having more experience in AAA and AA, it's very beneficial for those type of players. So long-term success, uh, I think it can be beneficial as well because you're, tr you're, you're teaching the game to the next generation of Padre players. So I yeah. think there's, there's only good that can come from it, but you have to buy in. Yeah, the buy-in for sure. Like the if the Mannies of the world, if they're gonna buy in on it initially, or they're gonna, you know, speak about it and say, "Hey, let's do this," then yeah. them, you know, leading through their actions and them actually buying into it, I think will be big for the rest of the clubhouse. Last question I've got for you: What do you think needs to change here with this Padres team from 2023 to 2024 with this offseason? I'm not saying like players like oh does a certain player need to be traded or do they need to acquire this i think we know the team needs but what are you seeing that you think could change here I, they have everything they have everything in place they have talent they have they have a great coaching staff they had a great coaching staff last year so from what i and i i did not watch every game from start to finish so i you know take this with a grain of salt but it seemed like some of the games that i watched when something went bad whether it be you know with two outs, the reliever walks the number eight hitter on four pitches and it's not close. And then the next hitter hits a home run or something like that. You know, where you're like, man, just, just those guys, so many strikes, he's going to get himself out, you know, or, uh, or a guy makes an error in the field. The next guy hits a double. Um, you need to stop the bleeding and you need, and I've been on teams where uh, you would pick each other up when mistakes happen. And I've been on teams kind of like the Padres last year where it was like, once something happened, you're like, oh, here we go. Like, we are going to find a way to lose this game. You know, it just felt like that. I felt like that watching the games, the limited games I watched. I mean, like, again, take this with a grain of salt, but it would be like if something like that happened, we were up four to two. I was like, oh, can we just find a way to win this game? You know, like, and it's it's a bad feeling. Whereas, like, winning organizations are like, we're going to win, you know. I've been on a team in St. Louis where we won over a hundred games and it was so fun going to the field every day because you're like, there's no way we lose. We're not losing this game. And you go in there and again, we weren't the most talented group, but we had this confidence about us and we were going to pick each other up because you're going to make mistakes. Baseball's a really hard game and it's very different. And guys are, are so much better than they, so much better than they were even when I was playing my last year was 2020. I mean, the athlete, in all sports has gotten so much better. I'm watching the game now. I'm like, I could not even hit what these guys are hitting now. I mean, it's everyone's throwing a hundred and it's moving both directions. Uh, just, just hit it the other way though. Yeah, no, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm out. This is why I'm, I'm doing insurance now. So, uh, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I think they have everything in place. I think they're going to, I, I really think it's going to be a bounce back year for the Padres. The city is so deserves it. And uh, I'm looking forward to a, a great, 
you know, 2024 season with a lot of excitement for sure. Can you speak? I said last question, but one last thing about Peter Seidler. Do you have any interactions, uh, any memories with him that you have that you'd like to share? Yeah, you know the 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 news when when he passed, that was such a, a gut punch for me. Um, and I I knew Peter, but I didn't know he knew me. So you know uh, the Padres do a good job with their alumni to like go the games. Um, so I've, I've been to a few games since I retired, probably about, you know, five or six. Uh, Tom, his brother, usually kind of sets it up and you you get to go to the owner's box. Like, it's unbelievable. And uh, Peter was in there one day and I went over to him. I said, hey, Mr. Seiler, just want to introduce myself. I'm Greg. You know, I, I used to play here. Uh, he goes, Greg, of course. And I know who you are. You know, like he was like, I was like, man, this guy actually knew who I was, you know, is uh, and all the things you read about him, I think, are is so true. And the impact he had on this city uh, and bringing in the talent and spending the money, um, so influential. Um, and, yeah, it's, it's so, such devastating news and so young. I mean, it's in his yeah. 60s. So, And I, I think everyone thought he knew he had some health concerns but didn't think that was in the forecast for any time soon. So, yeah, uh, gone way too soon, Has did a lot for the city. And personally for me, he was just always a nice human being and always treated everybody with the utmost respect. So that was that was tough news that day for sure. Yeah, great news that happened here today, though. Padres, they announced plans to honor Peter Seidler with the patch, and there's going to be a celebration of life in March of 2024. There's going to be a Peter Seidler, or there already is, Peter Seidler Legacy Fund. If you want to donate, just go to Padres' website. I'm sure they'll have... Uh, information on that the Padres will be matching that up to one million dollars so wow amazing awesome. amazing what they're doing there yeah no, it's Greg great stuff. yeah thank you so much for the time really appreciate it again everyone Greg Garcia former Padre former Cardinal had a lot of good things to say about Mike Schilt and what's going on here with San Diego Padres really appreciate it Greg this has been episode 524 Talking Friars podcast and YouTube show have a great night everybody see ya